So these, going back to the institutionalized traumatization of children and uh, all of that, all that that involves, how does that system produce somebody as uh, sort of wicked as Jimmy Savile? Uh, where, where did he pop onto the scene and what, I mean, you, you don't think he was a lone wolf. You think that he was a part of a larger organization of this sort of behavior, right? Yeah, I think in, in, like in movies, the heavy is often the guy that you see the most of. He's the guy that does all the heavy lifting, and so he can, he can be a central character. And uh, part of his use is that he, he's a terrorizer, right? So he's, mm -hmm. he, he has a higher profile often, the heavy, than do the, the guy who, the, the people who pay the heavy to do what he does, because they remain behind the scenes. So I think that's a fair description of Jimmy Savile, that he's, he's more visible as the bad guy in relation to his relatively low level uh, status. Oh, of course, it depends relative to what. I would say within the entertainment industry, he's pretty high up as you know, compared to George Clooney or someone probably. So he seemed quite low level in that way. He seemed lower level than he was in the context of you know, his lifetime actor role as a DJ, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in the context of what you're introducing, the superculture, he might seem to us higher level than he actually was because there's so few visible agents of that secret society network. Um, and well, I'm, I'm wary of trying to speculate or trying to talk about how that superculture is constructed it's partly why i write the books and then i kind of forget the books once i've written them and then what i retain is what i can talk about um so it's uh, neither say it's highly speculative in terms of how that superculture comes about how it functions and how it gives rise to someone like jimmy savile um because we're not on the inside where I do come back to uh, that seems more rooted is, I mean, when you ask how does someone like Jimmy Savile come about, the real answer isn't in the, you know, how, well, the deeper answer anyway is in, is in the psychology of it. Like what was it that created a Jimmy Savile? And I think there was an interesting symmetry and I, maybe this is in Striva too, um, the, the thing that interests us about Savile now, as in the things he did, the things he committed, and the things he, he was part of as a criminal, are, are mirroring the forces that shaped him and the things that happened to him as a child. Now, we don't actually know what happened to him as a child, but we do know a little bit about his pathology as, a, as an adult, and as a man. And I mean, not just in terms of his behavior, but I mean, his crimes, but in terms of his, um, well, his particular character and personality and his particular relationship to his mother, for example. Um, this is because I end 16 Mounts of Hell on Ed Gein, who is, who is the archetypal mother bonded psychopath whom Norman Bates in Psycho was based on and inspired by. So I really think, um, all roads lead back to mama. And of course we know this is true biologically, but it's also true psychologically. We kind of know that too, even if we're not Freudian, even if Freud's been largely rejected or dismissed, um, we still kind of know that intuitively, but we don't so often think about parapolitically, sociopolitically, culturally, the whole world we live in is shaped by individuals who are shaped by their mothers, by those formative two years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, I just gave you a really long general answer, didn't mm -hmm. I? But um, Jimmy Savile is, is, a, is an extreme example of a, a mother bonded psychopath, I'd say. And it's, I mean, the, the, the sort of smoking gun around that thesis is, is that he, he was, he kept his mother's room um, 
the way it was after she died and after she died he stayed five days alone with her body doing god only knows what because we know he's a necrophiliac uh so uh, it, yeah it's there in his behaviors that are driven and and this is it's also what i map uh, in later works of what we're talking about today the the uh, transhumanist drive to escape the body is is consistent with the drive to recreate uh, a matrix uh, of a surrogate reality, which is like a technological recreation of the mother's body in the womb, uh, which we plug into, as Neo did in the matrix, to give us life, but we also have total control over it. And I, I get to this in 16 Maps of Hell, and I finally managed to finish it. It was around this correlation. And also it's because it's uh, it's in Castaneda too, this, the old seers uh, who um, turn themselves into women, number one, some of them, in order to escape the inorganic beings. And number two, created surrogate worlds through dreaming to escape into. So I see in that there's parallels with transgender and transhumanism, obviously, but there's also parallels with uh, this uh, technological drive to to recreate reality in our own image which is inseparable from the mother's image like the image of the mother's body that we lost the lost object Norman Brown calls it so anyway I mean I didn't articulate as well as I, was, I would have liked but what I'm suggesting is that there's a, a common pathology driving all of this all the machinery that we're looking at and that is you know people are speculating about and getting paranoid about through conspiracy theory and and or else they're seeking to participate in through new age trojan horses and transhumanism right there's different ways of approaching it but none of them seem to really lead to the exit and part of that is i think that we're not seeing the elephant in the room which is mama it's the central, it's big mother, what I call big mother. Of course, it does coincide with the, the Eastern belief that we're in the Kali Yuga, as in we're under the rule of a dark goddess. And I would say that that dark goddess is, is our individual mothers, even if we loved them and we thought they did the best they could. But then the collective mother, which is, I suppose it's a distortion of nature, you know, the culture that's kind of in that's distorted and reshaped nature in terms of child rearing practices that we haven't had natural childhoods um, and part of that is that the mother's been centralized and there's something we don't question like we actually do sanctify the mother in our culture uh, we've got this idea that motherhood is something holy maybe it once was but mine certainly wasn't and I don't know anyone who was, and Jimmy Savile certainly wasn't, and the people who, who run our worlds, there certainly wasn't. So the world we have uh, isn't consistent with the idea that the kind of mothering that we socially and culturally advocate and celebrate is, is positive, because there's something fundamentally wrong there in our perspective. 